This is the official We Own This City podcast from HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm Dee Watkins, the host of this podcast and writer on HBO's We Own This City, a series from George Pelicanos and David Simon on corruption and abuse within the Baltimore Police Department. Is the Justice Department or even the Office of Civil Rights ready to declare that we long ago lost this war? That we've achieved nothing but full prisons and routine brutality and a complete collapse of trust between police departments and their cities? I fought this war, Nicole. I was even good at it and honest when I did it. But it was lost when I got there. And I did nothing but lose in my time. And the guys who are out there right now in the street, they all know it's lost. Are you people ready to say that out loud? Is anybody? On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Jamie Hector, who plays Baltimore City Detective Sean Suter and one of the series' executive producers and writers, David Simon. In the final episode of We Own This City, Jenkins, who was hailed as a hero for so many years, finally falls off of his throne. He is sentenced to 25 years in prison. Many call it justice, but it's not. As a matter of fact, it puts us right back where we started. And that's the reason why I love the choice to end the show right where we began in the first episode, with the scene of Wayne Jenkins giving a talk to a room full of eager police officers. But this time, it isn't just a collection of random faces. It's all the criminals we witnessed over the past six episodes dressed as cadets, sending the ultimate message to viewers. New officers coming in are trained by the old guys who broke the rules, who were trained by older guys that broke the same rules, and so forth. We also see that Mayor Catherine Pugh and Police Commissioner Daryl D'Souza both end up in federal prison as well. Disgraced politicians and crooked cops getting jail time is great for headlines, but never really helps the people who were at their mercy. They're left in grief, picking up the pieces of their lives, while the door stays wide open for the next group of ambitious takers to come in and do more of the same. Before we get to Jamie Hector and David Simon, I want to hear from the executive producer and writer George Pelicanos on some of his thoughts on this episode. Suter went the route of most cops. He started out in patrol. He was former military. And then he went to plain clothes. He was in VCID, and he's with Jenkins in VCID when both of them were, which is the Violent Crimes Division. And he had some dealings with Jenkins. And Ram, in the proffer sessions, said that in the old days, Suter took money. But he moved beyond that, and he eventually worked his way into homicide. And Souter, by all accounts, was a a good, straight homicide detective. But what happened to Sean was that his past put a cold finger on his shoulder. Sean Souter's been shot. He's in shock trauma. It doesn't look good. Head wound. We were going to grand jury him tomorrow. He's supposed to report at 11. He was told he wasn't a target. Ram's going to name him as taking money back in VCID. Yeah, but is that enough for him to... Yeah. For a cop, yeah. The death of Sean Souter is still, to this day, a controversy in in Baltimore. You know, just talking to citizens, talking to the crew, everybody had a different theory, a different opinion. Was he assassinated? Was he murdered? Was he killed by a random assailant? Or did he commit suicide? So on the day of his death, there was a camera mounted on one of the, uh, the buildings before he ran into that lot and was killed. We only shot what that camera would have seen. We don't go into the lot with Sean Souter and we don't see what happened because nobody saw what happened. The camera did capture him standing behind a van before he ran into that lot and said, stop police. And he appears to be pacing back and forth, deliberating to himself what to do. And that's pretty much all I can say about that. We were very careful in how we depicted it. My 
My next guest is Jamie Hector, a prolific actor you probably remember as Marlo Stanfield from The Wire. And we own this city, he plays Sean Suter, a cop who got caught up in a gun trace task force case and met a tragic end. I was really, really waiting to have this conversation. I'm so happy, Jamie. Welcome to the show. Thank you, D. Watkins. Thanks for having me, man. Truly appreciate it. So many Wire fans remember what you brought to the role of Marlo Stanfield, one of the most intelligent street guys ever. Mm. And then we get a chance to see the full range of your talent as you flip the script and play Detective Sean Suter. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you feel about making that transition and your process and what is that actually like? I felt great making that transition, especially because it's a piece that's so necessary. The part that I was most interested in was who he was. You know, the kind of man he was, the kind of father he was, his spirituality, you know, um, his value system. And I came to learn about the brother, and that shifted for me because Marlo Stansfield's value systems were, you know, they were a little different. He wanted the crown. But at the same time, there was a lot of humanity in him as well that people might not have seen. But I would have to say that the both of them were seeking, and the goal was to humanize them. Sean Suter had a great reputation. Sean Suter has an amazing family, People from communities had love for him in a way that you don't really see people from oppressed communities connecting to police officers. And my question for you is, if this guy has this great reputation and this guy tries to do the right thing, but because of the proximity to some of the officers like Wayne Jenkins, who he had to work with, still gets caught up and, you know, eventually loses his life. Yeah. How do you feel about a person who has that kind of reputation but still gets caught up in the corruption? Oh, that's the complications of life, you know, being flawed. Absolutely. Like the scriptures say, you know, try not to hang around negative people because even if you're positive, mm -hmm. their energy will sometimes influence you in some way or another, you know? You'll pick up their habits and their ways. And based on what everybody said about Sean, I would assume that the possibilities of the pressure of, and I'm not saying that this is factual, I'm not saying that he did anything, but the pressure and, like you said, the proximity of Jenkins and all of them and the potential pressure that they placed on him could be the reasons why he also did what he did. Right. I felt like people were trying to throw him under the bus because he was also gone. Mm -hmm. You know, how can a man that's not here defend himself? They didn't have a lot to say about him before we lost him. Mm -hmm. I think what happened to him is it shows people how corrupt the department is. And even if you have good intentions, it almost doesn't matter, which would definitely present a lack of hope for a lot of people who will want to be in or around that profession, you know? And I was listening to an interview with Chris Rock, and he said, you know, in this profession, there's no room for bad apples. <laughs> you know, you got to kind of be right at all times. Because when you're wrong and your job is to serve and protect, then people pay the consequences. Mm -hmm. We Own This City, is, as we all know, is based on Justin Fenton's book, We Own This City. And um, Justin and Baynard Woods and Brandon Soderbergh and even David Simon and Bill Zorzi, in a way, and myself and Jane Miller, for sure, are like the people who covered this or studied this as a collective probably more than anybody around. Like, we really, 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 really all have theories and we all try to pick at this stuff and learn from this stuff and make sense of it. Baynard and myself believe that it wasn't a suicide. Mm -hmm. Justin didn't take a hard stance because he he has information from multiple angles. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, in taking on a role and learning what you learned, did you ever even think about what happened or, or did you just want to stick to the script? Like what was going through your mind in, in trying to tackle this? Here's the thing for me, out of respect for the family, I never wanted to really address it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you if it was a suicide or a homicide, but I know that he's not here. For me, working on Sean, my goal and my agenda was basically to breathe life into this brother and try to tell his story. It's been a long time since The Wire, and um, despite all of the community work, it's wild that we're still having this conversation and creating this kind of art based on reality. How long do you think it's going to take for a city like Baltimore to actually get it in regards to leadership and policing? Brother, everything rises and falls on leadership, right? Right. And if they can't get it right up top, it's going to be a problem on the bottom. It's going to take 
for the people to really put in position people that's going to do right by the city and just analyze this thing to the bone marrow. The reason why is because it can be done because mm -hmm. it has been done. I mean, man, if Frederick Douglass was able to accomplish what he accomplished during this time period, W.E.B. Dubois, you name it, right? Yo, you know what's crazy? They both lived here. They did. Yeah, they sure did. <laughs> you know what they I'm sure saying? W.E.B. Du Bois, had, he had a crib right behind Morgan State University. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass used to live in Fells Point. Man, I think they blew up when they left. Is that, is that a <laughs> Is that a sign? But listen to what I'm trying to tell you. But you see what comes out of it, right? Absolutely. Listen, what comes out of the ground. <laughs> you know, I mean, whether you were born there, whether you came and you planted your flag there, it just goes to show you what the city's about, you know, what the city could produce and what the city produces. And it's just like, you know, people got to be held accountable, man. I really feel like this is something that should be addressed with urgency, you know? We don't got no time to waste. One of the things I wanted to ask you, I always wanted to ask you, is just as a fellow artist, when we work on projects that's rooted in reality like this, and, and sometimes those realities are heavy, mm. does it have an effect on you on your day to day? Or, or, or how do you separate some of that trauma you have to take in to play these roles to just going back to being Jamie, hanging out with the family, eating dinner and all that? My family is shaking me out of it, though. I tell you that. Mm. You go home, them kids will give you a schedule. <laughs> Shape things up quick. <laughs> like what you was doing? I don't care. <laughs> play with me. 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 Okay, play with me. Get off your phone. Play with me. And I'm like, what? That'll shake me out. Before that, though, you know, it took its time. You didn't realize the effects that it had on you. But as those residual particles still exist inside of you. Mm -hmm. It's you know it's not easy to get rid of it. You'll see it in conversation. You'll see it in quiet times and quiet moments. And real real props to Nina and HBO for bringing on the therapist to have a conversation with all of us, the entire cast, absolutely about how to not allow these things to stick to your soul, mm -hmm. you know, how to work it out. So to answer your question, yeah, man, I had exercises, man. I studied this. So this is how I trained, you know, I put the work in before I come into the game so that I could know how to get out of it, you know? So there's certain exercises that we always did that just allowed me to just snap out of situations, whether it's music, whether it's color, whether it's sound, whether it's um, watching a film or spending time with family and just understanding all the little things that happen and how to step away from it. Being able to be near family while filming, especially this kind of content, just gives us the luxury of understanding why we do it, why these stories matter, and how we're going to make it better for the next generation. Mm -hmm. So the think pieces are coming, the reviews are pouring in. If you can speak directly to the viewers, what do you want them to take away? You know, to witness reality and really allow it to affect you and say, we will never allow this to happen again. Whatever we have to put in position to make sure that this doesn't happen on a small scale, big scale, small city, big city. Because one life is too much, man. You know, you, you change the way a kid sees you if you slam them on the head when they're coming from Bible study. It's unacceptable. Absolutely. Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Nah, I appreciate you too, man. Thank you for having me, D. Yeah, man, thanks for the work that you put in for the community, you know? Yeah, no doubt. Life's work. <laughs> Life's work, absolutely. We Own This City owes a lot to my next guest, the mind behind shows like The Wire, The Deuce, The Plot Against America, David Simon. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be back on the podcast. So great having you on. What was the hardest part of, of taking these real events and making it into a television show? Because, I mean, I've been telling people I feel like this is like probably the most nonfiction miniseries they're ever going to see, as accurate as it is. I think the hardest thing for us was, and you know from being in the writer's room, the discussions we had about it's not enough to just show here's a bunch of bad cops. Are they going to catch them and how are they going to catch them? Mm -hmm. That's the easy part. You know, that's a story that's been told before. We really wanted to get into the why. Why does the department go to this place? Why do these police, who are not particularly sociopathic in all of their respects, but why do they get to this level of so sociopathy that... You know, they're, they're, they're literally behaving this way, antithetical to anything that a police should ever be. How does that happen? What's the journey? So for the why of it, which makes it a grown-up endeavor, 
to explain the why we had to break time. We had to go back into the careers of a cop like Wayne Jenkins and go all the way back to his first day. We had to have moments of reflection from later on from the interrogation room where they're talking openly to investigators after they've been caught about what they did and, and their own sense of why they did it. And so we had to break time. And you know how scared we were of losing viewers and making it too complicated. So we had to come up with a lot of visual motifs, things that we thought would help viewers travel that route with us. But that was it. Breaking time was the hard thing. Can we talk about the return, you coming back to Baltimore? And what did it feel like being back in these streets working again? Well, it felt like home. I mean, nothing's better than rolling out of your house and driving eight minutes and being at the set. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'll be you know? very clear. For people who don't know, you're a resident, right? Yeah. I see sometimes the angry people on Twitter call you a Hollywood guy, you know, like you're walking up and down Sunset Boulevard with your Chanel sweatsuit. <laughs> right. That's a theme that's been going back to The Wire. I mean, you know, when The Wire first came on the air, there was a lot of consternation at City Hall. There was talk about this out-of-town entity that had come into town and was impairing the city's reputation to no good end. And the city council took up a resolution against the show. And I went to the hearing. And I didn't say, hi, I'm David Simon. I represent The Wire. I said, hi, I'm David Simon. I live in the first district. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the councilmen just went, what? <laughs> you know, there was this moment of, what do you mean you live in the first? You know, aren't you in uh, Bel Air somewhere, Hollywood? You know, I was like, no. And I'd like to complain. I don't think the council should be making resolutions against storytelling in any form, but particularly storytelling that is political in nature. You don't like a story, don't watch it, <laughs> you know? But it felt good. It felt good to be home. And as you see, it's, it was sort of organically for this story that Justin had covered and that we had observed. And we thought it was in some ways speaking to whatever the generations of police work were that followed the wire because it didn't get better. It got worse. And so it felt good. You know, Dewan Prince, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dewan um, Wardrobe. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when I first met Dewan, he, he was 14 years old and he came out of the Lexington Terrace. We, we were shooting over the terrace when those towers were still up. And we were shooting there an episode of Homicide, like fourth season. And he stood by the uh, video village and Kathy Bates was the director and she let him call action and cut. And she explained what all the equipment was. And he kept following us around until he was 18, at which point it was the first season of The Wire. We gave him a job as a PA. Then Beeb Farrow found him in an unpolished jewel of a wardrobe guy who was really good at that. And she got him into that department and got him in the union. And, you know, he show back up into town after 14 years. And Dewan Prince is a 40-year-old man and he's doing wardrobe and he's, you know, and it's like <laughs> 26 years is a long time to be knocking around with this stuff. So the reacquaintance with Dewan and so many people like him who were in the crews of The Wire and, and even Homicide and The Corner. Yeah, that felt great. Those stories are the ones that just make me feel better than anything. Like when I talked to Debbie from Makeup about when she started out working on The Corner and oh, yeah. so many PAs and so many different people who worked on We Own This City are people like me who had to grow up dealing with Herschel, dealing with guys like Jenkins, dealing with the Rams of the world. And now they get an opportunity to be on the other side and not only finally see their stories being told on this major level, but they get to participate in the creation of it. And that's the added bonus on top of it. And that's that's why it's so important, making shows in Baltimore, what it does for people here, the hope it gives them to be a part of an industry that has been like a dream before shows like Homicide and The Wire and The Corner came to town. And to credit the people, you know, Barry Levinson obviously had a lot to do with Homicide being filmed here. I mean, I wrote a book, but he was the guy who brought television here. And the guy who basically started building a crew base that we could have this industry here was, was John Waters. Mm -hmm. That was the beginnings of the Baltimore crew base that has now really adjourned its weight class with a lot of cities in terms of the amount of quality work that's come through the town. But yeah, listen, it's the future of the industry for the people who, to come up, get some expertise, and then have a voice of their own. So, you know, keep at it. I'll probably be asking you for a job in about 10 years. <laughs> you'll, you'll have a writer's room and I'll be trying to hang on to the end of it. <laughs> hey, there'll always be a chair for you. <laughs> well, just have a little craft services there for me, you know. <laughs> My top three favorite books of all time is The Corner. And, and I think it does a good job at really fully flushing out and explaining how systemic racism works, how the drug war works, how this cycle happens and the why are the same in the way it deals with, with failed systems and how these failed systems continue to function. So for We Own This City, what do you feel like this piece adds to the conversation? Well, I think it, it's arriving at a time where maybe more Americans are now alienated from the premise of the drug war. There's been so much dysfunction 
for so long and so little gain that I don't know if it's a majority, but it's certainly a significant plurality of Americans are more amenable to the eye of ending the drug war. And this is a piece that basically says, and I know I sound like a broken record, we have to end the drug war. We have to abandon and disregard that mission for law enforcement. And until we do, nothing good is going to happen in American policing. Nothing good is going to happen. Communities are going to be alienated. Lives are going to be wasted. Corruption is going to occur. Government treasure is going to be spent on the wrong things. Crimes are not going to be solved at the rate they once were. I mean, you know this. You go talk to people in the inner city, in the roughest neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods are over-policed and brutally policed on the things that do not matter and the things that cannot make the neighborhood safer and cannot help people. And they are grossly under-policed on the things that would help people and would preserve the neighborhoods and would allow the community to thrive. You know, when people shoot people, when people rob people, when you walk out of your row house and your car is gone, you want a civic response. You want the right things to happen. And they're not happening now because we've trained a, a generation of police officers to do the wrong exact thing. I mean, never mind the corruptions of something like the Gun Trace Task Force. We've trained them to do the wrong thing as police officers. And it's because the mission has crept from being protect and serve and respond to meaningful crime to fight a drug prohibition, arrest everybody, and, oh yeah, militarize yourself because now you're scared of the community that no longer trusts you, where nobody talks to you. You can't trust anybody to be a juror in a case when you need them to decide that you're not lying because, hey, you lie. And so we have to get back to actually what matters. Police, as depicted in the series, seems like it's all about winning the war, owning the city instead of helping the communities that they're paid to police. Is it possible to change the culture at this point? Look, it was, it was a wall that got built in brick by brick. So pretend you don't have a bulldozer because you don't. You're going to have to take it apart brick by brick. Uh, it's going to take time to restore faith and trust in the process. But what do they say? A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And the fundamental thing that has to happen is we have to make drug addiction into a social and health problem that is addressed by social workers, healthcare professionals, treatment experts. And we have to re reimpose some economic connection between neighborhoods in places like West and East Baltimore or with the rest of the city. And we have to have some sense of shared future. That's a lot to change. But the first thing you have to do is basically declare that we're not going to be chasing people for arrests and to feed the criminal justice system with people who have addiction problems or people who are even serving people who have addiction problems. If you're not violent, we're not going to waste our resources. You try not to impose a full prohibition because at that point, you're fighting a war against 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people in a city of 600,000. It'd be one thing if you fought a drug war and it was, um, it, it worked. It'd be one thing if, you know, the addiction levels went down or the purity level of heroin or, or if, if suddenly the drugs were becoming harder to get. And if, if all that occurred and, and you could say, look, we're winning, but instead you filled prisons, addiction levels are as high as they've ever been. It's achieving nothing. So nothing happens until you basically throw up your hands and you agree to surrender and do something different. What do they say about addiction? You know, it's, it's, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome, you're an addict. You know, we're addicted to the drug war mm -hmm. and, and we have been for 50 years, 60 years. And ultimately it's led us to this dead end. Even if you change the rules, you, then you have to start changing how everyone thinks. That's going to take time because there's, there's such a level of distrust now and I don't see it happening overnight, but then I don't think we got here overnight. Mm-hmm. When people watch this show, they're going to go and they're going to look up all the articles. They're going to look up all the stories. They're going to look at the Slow Hustle documentary. They're going to just do deep dives into this whole case. And one of the questions I know they're going to have is the choices you made in depicting the death of Sean Souter. Okay. Uh, Sean Souter took his own life. I'm fairly convinced, you know, there's, there's such a wealth of physical evidence from the scene, logic in terms of, of his behavior the last days motive. I could go into it in great detail. I mean, I'm not sure I can do everything on this podcast, but I'll go piece by piece for about five, six pieces and understand there's about 14 pieces. Okay. But we'll just go with the big ones. His radio is in his left hand. Now the radio is no good to him as a radio because his partner is about eight seconds away up at the corner. And if he's really fighting for his life with an assailant for the gun, he's doing one of two things with that radio. He's dropping it all the while, he's screaming for his partner to get there because he's fighting with a guy. So he'd be shouting the partner's name. And he doesn't, he's not going to put it through the radio to dispatch. That's insane. He's not using the radio as a radio. 
The radio can't bring help in time. He might use the radio, if he's a good street cop, to hit the guy as hard as he can over and over with his left hand. Because the radio, is, as you know, for, for cops can be, a heavy handheld radio can be a weapon. So he's doing one of two things with that radio. If he's in an actual fight with somebody, he's either beating somebody trying to save his life, or he is dropping it so he has his left hand to assist him in fighting for the gun for his life with the right. He's not holding on to the radio. We actually have it on screen, the moment off of a policeman's camera when they rolled Suter's body. And he's still holding the radio, which is undamaged and has no DNA on it. Also, the gun is below him. It's not going to end up there unless he's already half on the ground, looking back over his shoulder to see that his partner's not there. And then when we get to the, the blood in the inside of the cuff, presumably he's losing a fight with this mystery assailant for the gun. How is it that his cuff is hanging loose off of the bottom of his arm? If he's fighting, if he's fighting for a guy with a gun, where does that guy grab you? Try to imagine a guy grabbing you to try to control a gun to make you shoot yourself in the head. He's going to grab you around your wrist. If he grabs you around your wrist, he's holding tight around the cuff of your shirt. You're not going to get blood on the inside. You're not going to get blowback on the inside of the cuff if you're fighting for a gun with an assailant. You will, however, if you're holding a gun to your own head and the cuff is hanging loose. The last thing is, Suter's partner on the day, Bomenka gets there and he sees the gun smoke at about waist level. So he's there very quickly that the gun smoke isn't starting to dissipate. And also that it's at waist level because Suter probably went down on one knee. He had mud stains on one knee, probably went down on one knee and looking back over his shoulder to make sure that Bomenka was not, did not have a, a bead on him, did not, had not cleared the corner yet, then, then fired the fatal shot, fired the two into the ground to simulate a fight. And then he fired the third one into his head. And we also recounted Detective Suter doing that pacing behind the van. He's contemplating what he's about to do, which is profound, dealing with the actuality of suicide coming in moments and what he needs to do. And, and he's, he's, he's marking how far Bomenka is. He sent him up to the corner and he, he's, he's marking how much time he has before he undertakes this. That actually went on for a longer period of time than we could commit to film. He's paying attention to the cars going by to make sure there's no other witnesses. And ultimately, here's the thing. From where he's standing behind the van, everything in the alley can see him standing there. If what he wanted to do was lure this mystery gunman or this, this mystery figure out of the alley and show that they had walked away, and you know, he, that's what he told Blamanka, you, you take that into the alley, I'll take this, and when, when he pops out, we'll grab him. If he, that's what he wants to do, why is he standing in full view of the alley? Right. And here's the other thing. A lot of the people that wanted to make this into a conspiracy, the police department wanted it to be a hero's death more than a suicide because that took the stink off of the fact that he was going to testify before the grand jury and that he was going to have to lose his job because once he started naming stuff, other people were already naming things involving his time back in plain clothes. Right. Ray had already named him in front of the grand jury as having taken money. So once he goes in front of that grand jury... He may not be indicted. He's not the target of the investigation, but he is going to lose his job. And ultimately, a lot of the street lawyering about, oh, no, the, the cops killed him because he was going to... First of all, they, they, they didn't need his grand jury testimony, and they didn't get it, and they convicted everybody. So that, that, that's also spurious. If you want to imagine that the police assassinated him to prevent his testimony, because that's the most exciting version of the story that people want, you have to ask yourself this. Why would the police have to fight him for his own gun? Why risk getting in a tussle so you can force a guy with his own hand to shoot? You might lose the fight. He might shoot you. Or you, know, or you might not be able to kill him. I mean, why, why does he have to be killed with his own gun in a wrestling match? You didn't want to show that. You just wanted to let the fans decide what happened. So if we can only show one th version. We, we basically gave you what is known. We didn't editorialize beyond what the known evidence is there. Right. But if you watch what happens, it, it, you know, it's, it's apparent what we believe. And, and I think we believe it with all of the evidence behind us. Other than abolishing the drug war, is there any other major point you want people to take away from the show? No. <laughs> it, it seems so wrong to ask for a second thing when the first thing is so big. All right. <laughs> like, like, how can you ask, like, oh, do this. And then if you have any time left over, you know, uh, demilitarize the police. You know, I mean, like, I think in some respects, I would ask them to worry about this. If we don't change course, if we don't change the mission, if we don't reflect on where these policies have brought us to this moment, try to imagine what the next generation of Baltimore police are going to be like. Thank you so much for all the insight and taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. Delighted, delighted. See you around Baltimore.
Thanks to all our guests, George Pelicanos, Jamie Hector, and David Simon. I also want to thank the city of Baltimore as we continue to fight for change. And a special thank you to you for listening to this podcast. It's been an honor to host it and talk to so many people who brought this important story to the screen. Peace to all the survivors until we meet again. This is the official We Own the City Companion podcast, hosted by Dee Watkins, and it's a production of HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. Our senior producer is Emmanuel Hapsis. Our consulting producer is Carrie Antholas. Maria Robin Somerville is our associate producer. Aaron Kelly is our managing producer. And our engineer is Hannes Brown. Our executive producers are Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna weiss -Berman. Production music is courtesy of HBO. And you can watch episodes of We Own This City on HBO Max. Until next time. <laughs>